and open them up to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> Title of the message is A Heart of a True Apostle. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to read from verse 7 to verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7 through 11. Paul says, and not only by this his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. As he told us of your longing, your mourning, and your zeal for me, so I still rejoice still more. Let's see, am I reading in the same? I'm sorry, I'm in, I'm in the wrong chapter. Paul says, Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preach God's gospel to you free of charge. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone, for brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained, and I will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the region of Acacia. And why? Because I do not love you, God knows I do. And Father, bless your word as it goes forth. In Jesus' name, amen. One day, a guy was shipwrecked on an island. And while he was on that island, he began to start building his own places and farming his own land and, you know, trying to survive, mostly. And he even set up a, a particular uh, system for SOS in case somebody would come. He had a fireplace, nice bundle of wood he would light. He also had it written in the sand, SOS, you know, he needed to be saved. He was the only one on the island. And lo and behold, one day he looked out on the horizon and there was a ship headed directly for the island. So boy, he got his fire wood together, he got his fire gone, he, the smoke was a blazing, fire was a blazing, he had his little flag, he was flagging every, every second he could get to get that, that ship's, or that captain's attention. The ship just kept coming closer and closer and closer to that island. And when he got there, they put their little dinghy in the, off the side and they went to the shore and they, they saw the guy standing there and it was, he was like, oh, thank God, y'all came. He said, I've been on this island for a long time. And he says, I didn't know if I would ever be rescued. And so the, the guy who was steering the boat to pick him up looked out on the, off on the, the, uh, the sand right back in the palm trees. And he says, uh, he noticed something. He noticed there were, there were three houses that were built. So he was curious and he said, uh, hey, he says, uh, I, I see you fare for yourself pretty well. He says, uh, you built yourself uh, three houses. You mind explaining to me why you built three houses or three huts? He said, oh, yeah, sure. He said, that first one over there, he said, that's my house. That's my living quarters. That's where I live. And he said, that other one was a church that I built. I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. He said, well, what about that third one? He said, well, I moved. I went to another church. <laughs> <clears throat> and folks, you know, it's, it's really, it's hard to say this, but it's the truth. The fact is that so many times, even in today's society, postmodernism society that we're living in, people have that same mindset. If they don't like the church that they attend, they go to another one. And they bring their troubles with them and bring it to another church. If they don't like that church, they go to another church. They keep, we call it buffet Christianity. So whatever fits your lifestyle, whatever fits your, your theological mindset, sometimes people will choose 
where they want to be comfortable rather than where they want to hear the truth from the Word of God. And as you well know, Paul and his, uh, his mission outreach to these Corinthians in his day and time of very talented people, a very uh, smart people, people who prided themselves on intellect. It wasn't a question of these folks not being smart. They were very smart. However, uh, they decided that their learning ability and their genius lifestyle, they thought they could incorporate the world into their lifestyle, into their living in the church. And so there was a lot of problem. But by this time in his letter, Paul began to win some of them back to the understanding of what God expects of them. Because remember, they were blood-bought the same way Paul was saved and became a Christian. However, there were those who were seated in that church that were false teachers. And, and one of the things that, that Paul, and I know it, it must have really pained him so, but I can only imagine, I just, I, I can't really empathize with what he went through. It pained him very much to begin to start talking about his credentials. Because it would almost seem like he's bragging about everything that he went through when God called him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. So it pained him devastatingly to be able to even suggest anything about anything that he ever did. But because of these false teachers, he wasn't going to give them a leg. He wasn't going to give them a foothold pertaining to what they were doing and their mindset. Remember, they were workers of Satan. They were there to bring Paul down, discredit his ministry. And that's just one of the areas Satan would use to be able to keep people from hearing and believing on the gospel. What better way than to trash Paul's character? And so they were going to use this whole premise of him being a Paul himself, being a false apostle. But Paul was going to turn it on them. And he was going to use many of the things that he did in order to verify who he was genuinely as a believer, as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, as a bond servant of Christ, and as an apostle called by Jesus Christ personally. And so he was going to defend his position. And here's what he's going to do. The one thing that was, begun, that was going to be so evident about this man's life was his humility. Now, you can only fake humility for so long. You can, all, you, you can only fake the outwardness, and then a lot of times it could be false humility, humility not something of the Lord, uh, just so you can gain what you want from the things of people that you love dearly to extort them. But looking at Paul and the humility that he had, that was one of the first things, and we will look at three of these points this morning. That was one of the first things that he possessed outwardly, inwardly, outwardly, was the very fact that he had the humility of Christ. Now let's go back to this chapter and unpack some of this truth. In chapter 11, and we're there in verse number 7 again, Paul says, Oh, did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preach God's gospel to you free of charge. What is he talking about here? This very fact. The Greeks, pride, remember, they prided themselves on their knowledge. And so they had these orators. They would go and they would get paid to speak. They would sit in sessions and people would listen to the, whatever the philosophy or whatever the view of opinion they had of that day, and they would pay them a lot of money to have those meetings. And now here's Paul who's preaching the gospel. Remember what he said about himself. He says, look, there's nothing big about me. I'm just, I'm, I'm just like anybody else. In fact, he's, he talked about how he, he had trouble speaking. He, he talked about how the fact that he didn't have a very outward appealing look, you know, and all those other things that came. And he, and he didn't deny it. He understood that. But yet the Greeks would look at him. Remember now who they were in for, Satan. So they wanted to destroy his testimony and call him all sorts of things. So now he's saying, look, understand this. He said, did I commit a sin just because I humbled myself before you? 
Just because I didn't charge you like these other folks were doing. Remember, he's making a comparison. He says, come on, understand this. Then I'm doing this because God called me to do it. And I'm not doing this because I want to get paid. Now, you know, it just goes against the grain of the world. You know, a lot of times we figure if, 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 we're not, if we're not paying something for a high price, then we're not getting a deal. Now, y'all know that's not true, right? Like I said, my wife is a great shopper, and she'll go in some of those places in these stores, and she's a very frugal shopper, and she'll go and she'll find a dress or a shirt or whatever that might have had a price tag of $30 a month ago. And now it's $5.95. Bought some t-shirts the other day. I'm sure they were going for like $14, $15, $20. To cut down to like $5 and something a shirt. Well, at one time it was high price. Now think about it. If you bought that shirt at the price, at the premium they put on there, you're thinking you got a great deal, right? I paid a lot of money for it. Nobody else can afford it. I paid a lot of money for it. But when it's cut down to $5.95, what about that shirt now? Nobody wore it. So I'm just using an illustration, a comparison. But the fact that you put a price tag on what somebody says, especially if it's not gospel, you see, you're going to say, well, man, man, I paid a lot of money to go sit in $30 for a session. And, And you know what? He spoke a long time, and maybe there were some things I could draw from that. But what about its eternal merit? What about its value in eternity? So they looked at Paul and said, well, look, why aren't you charging all this money? In fact, they were just accusing him of stealing all kinds of money. But for the most part, he says, look, I'm not charging anything. And now you're accusing me by the very fact that I'm not charging anything, and then you're saying to me that I'm not humble in character? He said, or did I commit a sin in humbling myself to you? so that you might be exalted because I preach God's gospel to you free of charge. Well, interesting, the phrase humbling myself, or if you have a King James, it's abasing myself, means in my mode of living, waiving my right of maintenance and earning by its manual labor. So Paul is very clear what what he talked about here concerning the lifestyle that he lived. It was a humble lifestyle, poor of means. So let's look at verse number 6. We looked at this passage of Scripture last week, but verse number 6, clearly Paul is talking about how he identified with his competitors, these false teachers, false apostles. He says, even if I'm unskilled in speaking, so he see, he admitted it. I am unskilled in speaking. I am not so in knowledge. But see, again, Paul, I consider him a genius. Indeed, in every way, we have made this plain to you in all things. So he says, I'm not denying it. I'm not making, me, making myself out to be something I'm not simply because I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, a called out one by Christ. In, uh, in chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, Notice what else he says pertaining to his accusers. He says, For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. You see, simply because he didn't dress a certain way or because he didn't talk a certain way, he doesn't count. He's nothing. See? Again, that's that's Satan's plan. So, Paul of his manner of service, it was plain for everyone to see. He was a very humble guy. And in verse, uh, in verse 8, it was also his manner of support. Verse 8, back in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul says to them, I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. Now what is he talking about? I robbed other churches. Well, the word robbed means to spoil, to plunder, or seize, or snatch away. So we're going to look at some of these definitions here in a lot of other scriptures. But for the most part, think about it. They were accusing Paul as, a, 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 as someone who conquered an enemy, and there was a fallen soldier on the ground, and they would go and they would pilfer, and they would take all the things that were of value to them. That's what they were accusing Paul of doing. If we turn to the book of Acts... In chapter 18, verses 1 through 3, Paul says, 
After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had compelled all the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. Verse 3, And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. So Paul... May have been 40 hours a week, may have been 48 hours a week, I don't know. But for the most part, by trade, he was a tent maker. That was his job. And it, that's how he was employed. Knowing that this is what God also called him to as a minister of the gospel. We can look at another point of reference in Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. And verse 10 through uh, 20. So if you want to turn there, you're welcome to do that. Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you may you have revived your concern for me. For you indeed concern indeed concern for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I'm in to be content. I know how to be bought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger and absence and need. This is one of my favorite verses. But you've got to take that verse into context of what he's saying before that and what comes after that. He says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now remember, the northern part of Greece, Macedonia, Philippi, Berea, that, those were the poor Christians. Remember, we discussed that a few weeks ago. And, and they were giving out of what? Out of their poverty to help Paul, to help these, to give him money to send back to these starving Christians in Jerusalem. The southern part, Athens and Greece, were the more sophisticated. They were the rich people. They're the ones who had the money. But they waited a whole year before they decided to give. And Paul had to remind them about the promise that they had made. And they said they were going to donate money. Remember, they weren't donating money to Paul. Whenever Paul went out on a missions trip, remember, folks would, would supply his need, but they were coming from different directions, especially from the ones up north. They were, they were there to help him. Remember, they were giving out of their poverty to help him. Paul wasn't going around begging for money, but at the same time, they were helping him, blessing him. And in verse 14, it says, Yet it was kind of, a, it was kind of you to share my trouble... And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, remember Macedonia and the Philippi, he said, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once again. Not that I seek the gift. That's so important. Let me make a little comment here about that particular little phrase. Because I've known preachers to get up behind the pulpit and begin to start telling people, oh, you know what, I, I got a screen porch that needs to be fixed. Uh, uh, you know, I got grass that I need to have cut. And, oh, you know, I got this bill, this light bill that came due or doctor bill that came due this month. I know preachers that did that. And they're still doing that today. They get up and they start telling them about all the congregation or whoever listens to their needs they have each day. And so you know what happens? People become under compulsion to give, and they really don't want to, but they're giving because he's the preacher. Paul wasn't doing that. He wasn't getting up on a box, a soapbox, and telling these churches, you got to give to me because I'm an apostle. you got to give to me because I'm the preacher. See, that's one of the temptations many of pastors have in this country. I'm not saying all of them, but that's one of the temptations. Paul says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek, notice what he seeks, the fruit that increases to your credit. What fruit is he talking about? The fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Love, peace, joy, meekness, kindness, all the things that come from the Spirit of God, humility. He says, that's what I want to see come from your life. And then in verse 18, he says, I have received full payment and, he, and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Whatever that was, he just thanked God for it. 
And he gave God the credit for it. And verse 19, he says, And my God will supply every need of yours according, notice, to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul made it clear. He says, I'm not trying to extort anybody. And I'm grateful for what I already have. And he says, you know, there are people who sin. They give me some gifts. They give me some food. They give me a place to lay my head down to sleep. I'm grateful for that. But you know, the scriptures is clear. You know what we truly, you know the only two things we deserve? Food and clothing. Really, we don't deserve that. But we have it. And the Bible's clear that if a man does not work, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. If you can get mad at me, you got to get mad at God because he's the one who said it. A man don't work, he don't eat. Amen, Brother Tony. <laughs> man don't work, he don't eat. And we have a lot of hard workers here. And you know, God gives you the grace. He gives you the stamina. He gives you the strength to work. And I know we have retired people too. But just because you retired, do you stop working? Maybe not for so much a boss, but you know, you can't stop working. It just doesn't, hey, it just doesn't come to you. So Paul made that clear. And giving God the credit. Now, while he was at, while he was in Corinth, remember that was his second trip, he wrote, missionary trip, he wrote first and second Thessalonians. And in chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians, he says this, verse 8. He says, Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might, be, that we might not be a burden to any of you. And I really believe that's what he did. And he says, verse 9, he says, not, It was not because we do not have the right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. Boy, I tell you, leadership, servant leadership by example. And somebody was telling about someone this week, a local business, and a guy just purchased a business, and uh, so he was... <clears throat> He owned this business now, and he, so he, what does he do? He starts setting an example on what to do and how to do it. Cleaning floors, cleaning the toilet, displaying his cases, whatever that might have been. His hands were in that business by example, showing those other workers, this is how the boss wants it done. He wouldn't just sit behind the desk and say, do this, do this, and do that. You know, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always of this opinion. Especially those of you who are in leadership and you are, you know, you have a company or you run a company. Lead by example. If you're not going to do it, don't tell somebody else to do it. Does that make sense? Why would you tell somebody to do something if you're not going to do it? Paul, he could have said, look, I'm an apostle. You've got to bring the money to me. You've got to give me a six-figure salary. Like some of these preachers today. I'm a preacher. I'm a TV evangelist. You got to come to, you got to bring the money to me. See, that's how they think. Paul says, no, -uh, no, no, uh, -uh. Even though I have every right to do that. And he did as an apostle. He chose not to. He chose not to. Why? So that his accusers wouldn't get the upper hand on him. That was the whole point. See? And they could say, well, look at Paul. He's getting a big salary. He can drive around in a big car. Why? Because they, they're giving him the money. I said, no, uh -uh. no, I'm working for it just like you. You can't accuse me falsely. You want to, and you can, and you do, but you have nothing. It's like throwing jello against the wall. It won't stick. <laughs> you can't accuse me of that. I'm a servant of the Lord. I'm a bound servant of Christ. I'm going to live by example. Not by law. Not by legalism. And that was his manner of support. What else? His manner of surrender. You see, you can surrender to a man's way of doing things, or you can surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse number 9, he says this. For this is what the promise... Wait a minute. I'm in Romans.
And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my needs. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. The word burden means without weight. You see, that was the heart of Paul. He wasn't going to lay anything to anyone else so that anyone, especially his false teachers, these false apostles, would lay any claim to him in saying, Paul, you did it for the money. Well, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verses 1 through 23. Well, let me read it to you. Again, we covered all these verses. Paul, an apostle, as he states again, he's having to defend his position before these false teachers. He didn't have to. Again, it wasn't one of, the, one of the things he wanted to do, but he really had no choice. He says, am I not free? Verse 1, am I not an apostle? Of course, those are rhetorical questions. Yes. Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Yes. Are, you not, are, are not you my workmanship in the Lord? So he's talking about how he had won them to Christ. And he saw them as a father, spiritual father. Verse 2, and he says, if, if, if to others I am an, I'm not an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Now remember what they were doing. They were betraying him. The very people who won the, that he won to Christ, they were betraying him. They were turning their backs on him. Verse 3, he says, this is my defense to those who would examine me. And when they did a lot of that. Verse 4, do we have the right to eat or drink? Do we? Yeah. Do we have the right to take along a believing wife? Do we? Yeah. See? Apostles, when Peter was married, as do the other apostles and the brother of the Lord, Cephas. That's Peter. Verse 6, or is it only Barnabas and I who have, not, have no right to refrain from working for a living? He didn't, they didn't have to work, but they did. Chose to. Who serves as a soldier in his own expense? No one. Who plants a vineyard without eating of its fruit? No one. Who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? No one. Verse 8, do I say these things on human authority? Of course not. Does not the law say the same? Yes, it does. For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. It is for, ox, it is for oxygen, oxen, oxen that the Lord is concerned. Does he not speak entirely for our sake? Yep. Is it, it was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher should hope in fresh and hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap the material things from you? Of course not. If others share the rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Absolutely. Nevertheless, we have not made, of course there's the emphasis, we have not made we have not made use of this right, but we endure everything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. You see that? You see how, you see how Satan works? And he put that into their mind. Now, you know, I, I, it's, it's, for me, it's still, it's still puzzling in, in some aspects because why would anybody who came to know Christ, Paul preached the gospel to them, he, he lived by example, he lived with them for almost two years, they saw his manner of working, he was a tent maker by trade, and, 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 they, and they saw him, but yet after he left, these false teachers came in and put a little bit of deception in their mind about him. And they fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. I mean, they just... And I, and I asked myself, well, why would they do that? Why would they turn against Paul after they saw him live out, by example, a lifestyle that said this, I'm not going to be a burden to you. And then listen to those false teachers. Folks, your enemy and our enemy is deceptive. The Bible calls him the father of lies. And he will stop at nothing to put a doubt in your mind 
probably why you're even here today. What's the whole point of going to church? What's the whole point about Christianity? You know, that's how he works. And once, listen, once he gets a foot in the door, he's got you. And what happens is everything that you've learned, the things that you know are true, go right out the window. And his deception, oh, I've got to tell you, you wouldn't think that would happen, right? But, but let me just tell you how that happens. Uh, modern day. Why would people fall, fall for false teaching and, and false doctrine and, and, and just make following of, 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 of other things other than the gospel? Why, why would people go after those things? Why would people leave one church and go to another church and go to another church and go to another church? I remember a guy one time, he'd look at his watch. He came to a Bible study, look at his watch, and he'd say, well, you know, I've got a meal over here. Uh, Wednesday, I got a meal over here at this other church Thursday. I got another meal here on Friday. I'm thinking, was that all you think about church? Where you can get a meal? And if I told you next Sunday we're going to have fried chicken, I wonder how many people would show up for fried chicken next Sunday. <laughs> Thank you for being honest, brother. But you know, that's what, that's what people think about when it comes to Christianity. What's in it for me? Remember Jesus, when he would teach and preach on the hillsides in Jerusalem and Galilee, he'd talk about what? The kingdom of God, right? And he'd have a gathering. Thousands and thousands of people would come out there, and they would sit down while he spoke. Miracle how he got to everyone's ear. But that's God. And they heard him speak. And, and, and all the while, he's telling, he's challenging them. He's challenging them in the, in the lifestyle that they're in. And now he's challenging them about what they need to do to have a new life. And when he began to talk about the things like, you know, crops, sheep, houses, soil, trees, gates, oh, they put, their ears perked up, and that's how he got their attention. But then when he started telling them about the root of the matter, about their lives, and how they lived in sin, and how they needed a Savior, how they needed Him, guess what? They quit following him. Why? Because he expected something from them. He wanted them to trust in him as the only Lord and Savior. As the only one who could forgive them of their sins. But look, they're looking at him and thinking, what sin? All we want is a free meal, like you gave us. All we want is free health care, like you gave us. All we want is to be delivered from this Roman oppression because you're going to be king. And that's what we want. We're thinking about what? The here and now. We ain't worried about Judgment Day. So you know what? After a while, they got tired of the message because he said that. He told that to his disciples. He said, what about y'all? He said, there's a bunch of them who just left because they see what they heard was hard sayings. In other words, you got to give up your sin. They didn't want to do that. So, Jesus looked at him and said, are you going to leave too? But you see, again, these young Christians, they were babies. You know, they put anything in their mouth. But you see, that's the thing about Satan. He knows exactly where you are in your spiritual maturity. That's why people don't read their Bible today. That's why people don't spend time in going to Bible study. That's why people don't want to hear sound doctrine anymore. It's because they want to have their ears tickled. They want to be entertained. They want to sit under, uh, you know, a two-hour... I mean, if that's what you want to do, go right ahead. But do you understand the implications of that? You keep eating Buddha every day. I love Buddha. You keep eating crackling every day. I like crackling too. Never, I never wore out a taste for it. What do you think is going to happen if you eat that every day? They're going to kill you. Right? I mean, everyone in this room has enough common sense to know that. So what do you think is going to happen if you're not taking in the Word of God as a Christian every day. Man will live, man will live by the things of this world and think he's okay. But the word says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Matthew 4.4. 4. Your spiritual food is the word of God. 
And if you're not getting a daily intake of the Word of God, you come on Sunday, that's great. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But what about every day during the week? You're spending time in the Word of God. Oh, but bro, Tony, you don't understand. I got to get up early in the morning. I got to go to work. And you know what? I got these kids over here that always have demands. And you know, I got, I got these people over here that are old. And I got to go see about them. I got to cut my grass. I don't have a whole lot of time. Well, how many excuses can we come up with, huh? But you're not going to go a day without eating, are you? Paul says, I didn't want to be a burden to these Christians because he understood the implications behind all of that and what his false accusers would, would hold so dearly to accuse him of something. You know, it's the same thing what they did with the Lord. They looked for every reason to trap him. But you know what? They couldn't do it. He's God. And they, tr you see, that's the thing about the devil. He will stop at nothing to think he will succeed. And maybe he's got you duped. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking, well, you know what? I'm okay. You know, I play the game, but I'm all right. I see myself as okay. Well, let me tell you what, you're a deceived person. If you think you can continue to live your life without Jesus Christ, you're deceived. I'm not just talking about a one-time thing. And that, you know, again, that can be, could be a confusion about a lot of things. Maybe they were thinking the same thing, too. You know, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. That's what they were thinking. They were saved, and they were going to heaven. Now I can live the kind of life I want to live. That's what some people actually think. I'm saved. I'm, I was baptized. I was raised in a church. So I can live like I want to live. Seriously? Really? You need to go back and read your Bible. So his manner of surrender was pretty plain for all to see. Secondly, truth is evident. He had truth in his life, and that was evident. His manner of his inspiration, back in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 10. Paul says, as the truth of Christ is in me. That's a huge comparison, folks. Because we understand what the Bible says, right? Jesus Christ says, He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by Him. John 14, 6. There is no other way. Paul is identifying with the only source of truth. With the only one whose truth, from top to bottom, inside and out, as far as you want to reach into the heavens, Jesus Christ is truth. Not subjective, but absolute truth. And no other. Don't you believe with all these talk show hosts at the end of the day? I remember one time uh, Oprah Winfrey said, and by the way, she follows a cult. That's her own. She said, there are many ways to God. She said that. There are many ways. She doesn't believe there's just one way to God. She believes there's many ways to God. Do you believe that? Do you believe there's many ways to God? Michael Jordan, he believes in Zen meditation. Remember, all of this stuff is not, it's what we call today, they call the New Age movement. It's not new, it's old age stuff. Eastern mysticism, it all comes from the pit of hell. It goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel, where every man thought he was God. That he could create God in his own image. And he could worship a tree or a frog or whatever he wanted to worship. A bike, he could worship a bike. Doesn't matter. Satan doesn't care what you worship. But when you look to Jesus Christ, he starts looking at you. That's why Jesus Christ is the name above every name. And one day, one day, Jesus is going to put his foot on his neck and he's going to say, that's it. No more your shenanigans. No more your deception. But his manner of inspiration as the truth of Christ is in me. This boasting, this, in other words, what he's saying, this rejoicing is what he's saying. That's why he put the word boast on it. Because you would look at it and you say, well, he's bragging, right? No, he's, he's rejoicing. So he puts a lot of emphasis on it by using the word boasting because this was his life. This is who he bragged about. This is who he rejoiced in. This was his whole life from start to finish. The day that he met Jesus on the Damascus Trail, on the Damascus Road, that's when his life 
change forever. And he says, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the reasons of Keisha. It's just, and I'll read that verse to you in a second. But remember who's his manner of inspiration. It's Jesus Christ alone. Who empowered him? The Holy Spirit of God. But his whole focus was on Christ. Why? Because Christ is the gospel. He's the person. He's the risen Savior. He's the only one who loves you unconditionally. And let me just say this too while I'm thinking about this forgiveness. It doesn't matter what sin you've committed, God will forgive you through Jesus Christ. That's God's, you see, that's God's act of mercy. That's God's act of justice against sin. But at the same time, you see, it's not His will that any should perish, but that all should come to the saving knowledge of whom? Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter what sin you committed. And I know I've heard people say that, you know, God can't personally, He can't possibly forgive me. God forgives sin, folks. No matter where you find yourself today, He can forgive you. He will forgive you. But you've got to repent. I want to put that in. Well, preaching the gospel message was Paul's greatest inward desire in his life. Turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I want you to see what, what, what really was at the heart of, his, uh, of this man and his existence on this earth. For the few remaining years he had left. Verse 16, he says this. For if I preach the gospel... That gives me no ground for boasting. In other words, to brag on himself. For, it, for necessity is laid upon me. Now watch what he says at the end of that verse. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. <laughs> he, couldn't, he could not be silenced by anyone. Now you know what? Today, folks, they can take away your car, they can take away your house, they can take away your property, they can take away your little life savings, but one thing they can never take away from you is Jesus Christ. That's why I can brag about it, see? You can lose everything, but one thing you will never lose as a Christian is who Christ is in you. No one will ever take your salvation from you. And let me just say this too while I'm on the subject about the churches here and on the subject about this particular church in general. This church, yes, stands on the Word of God and honors the Word of God and honors Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We honor and treasure the Word of God. But this church, you don't have to be in this church to be saved. We don't have a corner with God. We can't say to God, this will be the only church where you'll get saved in. I got saved in an ice cream truck. <laughs> but so many times people will say, we're the only church church. We're the only church that you're going to get saved in. They got churches who teach that. Now, I'm not going to ask you for a show of hands, but... Harry Potter is one of those big subjects a lot of young people dwell into. Read. Maybe you've read the books. Maybe you saw the movies. And you know, a lot of times people would look at that and say, what's so innocent about, you know, reading a book by Harry Potter? I, I, I don't read it, but I don't know how many books you've put out there. But <clears throat> remember, false teachers are going to use any type of narrative they can possibly use to do this. To put a kink in your armor. You know what I mean by that? A seed of doubt. That's what Satan does. That's, he's brilliant at what he does. I don't like to give him the credit, but that's what he does, and it works. And once he's got a little, once he's got a little kink in that armor, then he can start feeding you all this other garbage. Like, for instance, Harry Potter, Potter to your kids. Let me just read something to you. This is a description given on, on OKUN UK Books website for the first Harry Potter book, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. 
Harry Potter's an art, ordinary boy who lives in a cupboard under the stairs at his aunt and uncle's house. Little does he know that his life is to change irrevocably when he's rescued by an owl and taken to Hogwarts School of Wizardry and Witchcraft. Learns about his parents' mysterious death and comes face to face with the evil Voldemort who is a deadly duel. Here's another description from Newsweek magazine. And I quote, Firmly in the eccentric tradition of the English children's story, Harry, like Peter Pan and Mary Poppins, can fly. Like Tolkien's Bibbo Braggins, he is surrounded by fantastical creatures. His boarding school is full of dotty pop professors and snobby brats. But it is also a world where owls deliver the mail instead of chemistry, and Jim, they study poor potions and transfigurations. Malcolm Jones, magical for millions, Newsweek, as he reports it back in 1999. Among the terrifying images in his books, two and three, were a disembodied voice repeatedly hissing, kill, monstrous, flesh-eating spiders, children being attacked and paralyzed, and that an apparently dead cat hung upside down by its tail. Oh, by the way, when I was studying through Moody, one of the professors suggested I read Harry Potter. I refused. In book four of the series, Goblet of Fire, the evil character named Wormtail cuts up Harry's arm to extract blood in order to bring Voldemort, the most evil character, back to life. This is an occult practice done to supposedly pass mystic, mystic powers from one person to another during some occult rituals. And I won't read the rest of it, but you get the picture, right? This same person who, by the way, wrote these books, J.K. Rowling, a real practicing bona fide witch. Oh, by the way, she loves Halloween. That's her favorite day of the year. Now, you've got to be thinking, as something as a child's book that would fall under that heading in the movies, what could be so horrible about that? You know, Satan's looking for anything to discredit you, parent, to discredit you, teacher, especially if you're in a professor or you're a public education teacher. He's looking to instill those things into you so you can go to those classrooms and tell those kids, there's nothing wrong with that. These little minds that are tender, that are at the point where they can learn and be taught the things of God being replaced with satanic alcohol practices. Paul wasn't going to have any of that. He knew. He knew what was at stake at the tender minds of these young Christians. And what would, what would be best to get their attention away from Paul and what he was teaching concerning the gospel than to use deceit and lies. Now, folks, please understand, I mentioned this last week. Satan does not come as some hideous-looking thing. I, watched, I don't really watch uh, that much of uh, Dr. Phil that much, but just so happens he was dealing with a couple that were involved in the occult, and they had some pictures up on the screen showing the different pictures that he saw in his mind and she saw. But let me just say this. If you're going to take drugs, you're going to be seeming those demons. That's what they're doing, taking drugs, they're drawing these pictures, these hideous-looking, demonic-looking figures. Now, who would have anything to do with that? Nobody. But let me just say this. Satan does not come across as something hideous-looking, or else you wouldn't have nothing to do with it. He comes so subtle, so seductive, so in a quieting manner into your mind, and making you think you've got to have it. Boy, he's, he's very seductive, and he's very keen. He's very good at what he does. But let me just read a couple of things about what the Scripture says in regard to dealing with the alcohol, or if you're deviling in it. 
Uh, Leviticus 19.26 says, You shall not eat any flesh with its blood in it, and you shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes. Chapter 19, verse 31 of Leviticus says, Do not turn to mediums or necromancers. You know what me necromancing is? Praying to the dead. You say, well, we don't do that. Uh, what? There's, there's big, big religion here in town. They, all over the world. That's what they do. They pray to dead saints. That's necromancing. Do not seek them out, and so make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. You see how subtle this is? And then lastly here this morning, love is evident. His manner of his motivation. Everybody has to have a motive for the reason they do certain things. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and in verse number 10 and 11, because they go in together. He says, and the truth, As the truth is of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the reasons of Acacia. Why? And that's the question he uses. And why? Because I do not love you? On the contrary, it's rhetorical. Yes, he says, he does love them. And notice, God knows I do. So God, he always calls God unto his witness. Why? Because he had a conscience, just like you have a conscience. His manner of motivation was this, out of pure love, out of his love for them, not for what they had. You know, I tell folks all the time, I say, if you can't be my friend for what I don't have, I don't want to be your friend. That's the problem with society today. If you're going to be my friend, you've got to have something that I want. Right? I mean, that's what we think. Now, I'm not talking about anybody in this church, but that's the, that's the mainline belief system here. The only way I'm going to be your friend is you've got something for me. And vice versa. Well, that wasn't Paul's motivation. It was simply to love them. It was simply to tell them what was true. And you see, that's what happens sometimes. People get mad. They don't want to hear the truth. <laughs> we don't want to hear the truth. Tell us what we want to hear. Tell us the things that will make us excited in our mind towards carnal things. What was his manner? Again, agapo. The word love in the Greek means this. Used in a social or a moral sense. It means to welcome, to entertain, to be fond of, or to love dearly. And that was... That, that was on any question. Paul risked his life for these individuals. Now, now, you know, there's no greater love than a man lay his life down, right? That's what Jesus taught. And in the same way, he was relentless. Why? Because he understood this. Eternity was in the balance for these souls. And Satan, the culprit, wanted to destroy his testimony so that what? They would follow after these false teachers. And that would be the only way these false teachers could gain an audience with these folks. Really, what they were, you know what they wanted, really? We'll look at them next week, or not next week, but the following week. What they really wanted was their money. Money. Every false teacher, that is his bottom line. Money. So 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 6. says, If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. And then in chapter 20, same chapter 1, verse 23, he says, But I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. Remember what he was going to do. He was going to deal with the sin in, there, in that church. He was going to deal with them in a, in a physical manner. Remember, divinely inspired. And he didn't have to. Folks, here it is. You know, you think about how much God loves us. There's no one, no one can love you more than God can love you. It's just like parents. You have children. If you're blessed with children, praise God. Your, your children will never love you more than you love them. Do you know that? So you understand where that's coming from. 
But God loves you even more than that. If you took everybody in the whole world and everybody that ever lived on planet Earth and put them all together and say love, they could still never outdo God's love. Period. Because he's love. The Bible says he's love. And he demonstrates that love. And how did he do it? He did it on the cross. That's why Paul was so adamant about this whole possibility of people who are dead in their sins, undeserving of heaven and eternity. He knew, because you see, he was also a murderer. <laughs> Although he followed under the name of religion for what he did. He'd say, God, God, just like those people who ran into those buildings there. They did, they said they did it for Allah, for God. Well, I wonder where they woke up. Paul did it for the true living God. He understood what Christ did for him. But he wasn't going to do it at his brother's and sister's expense. <laughs> Well, that's it. I'm telling you, you don't, that's far and few between today. You don't hear that today. Everybody's on this business mode. And, well, how much money we can make? They're making gobs of money now with Wall Street. Gobs of money. Just money on top of money. And, and most of them are not going to be able to spend it all in their lifetime. <laughs> so there's got to be another reason, see? But you see, that's how it is. When a person does not have Christ, he can never have his needs fulfilled. When a person is not in right standing with God, he can never, ever be forgiven. He can't forgive himself. So what does he have to do? He's got to bow his heart to Jesus Christ. He's got to repent of his sin. Paul knew once he did that, you see, now he became out from underneath the dominion of Satan. Satan knows that. So once you trust Jesus, once you repent of your sin, once you put your faith in him by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, what he did on the cross, only what Jesus Christ did, what does he do? He forgives you. Genuine rep repentance will bring about forgiveness and also bring about change. Well, you might step in the, the left or the right, but you'll always get back on, the, back on the path of righteousness. Why? Because God's not going to let you fall through the cracks. But then it has to be something you must do. You must obey what he says. You can't just say, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. I'm going to heaven, I'm going to heaven, and think that you don't have to obey what the word of God says. There's some of you sitting here in this room today, and you know you're in disobedience with God, but you don't care. Friends, I'm here to tell you, God loves you, but he wants you to get right. And I say this to you in love. I don't say this to you because I'm looking at you thinking, well, you know what? I don't have any problems in life. Everything in my life is hunky-dory. <laughs> I'd be lying to you if I told you that. But I'm grateful. I'm thankful. I'm a saved man. I get the privilege of preaching the Word of God to you. See? And I know there's nothing special about me other than I'm a blood-bought Sinner, by the grace of God. See, that qualifies me, and I'm grateful for that privilege. A little girl was talking to a teacher about whales. The teacher said it was physically impossible for a whale to swallow a human because even though they were a very large mammal, their throat was very small. The little girl stated that Jonah was swallowed by a whale, and the teacher reiterated that a whale could not swallow a human. It was impossible. The little girl said, when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah. The teacher asked, what if Jonah went to hell? The little girl replied, then you ask him. <laughs> You see the heart of an apostle and why he wanted to tell these believers who their allegiance should have been to today? 
your allegiance, if you're a believer, should be to Jesus Christ and Him alone. Would you stand, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, today again as always for this grace day, God, you've given us to worship you and praise you in. And Lord, I'm just, again, thankful that, God, you are a merciful God and you're a forgiving God. You're God who does not wink at sin. 